Um, I don't see any pitchforks here, but I'm sure that some people are not necessarily happy with me. If you, if you don't, if you're unhappy with me, then Freddie did it. Um, <laughs> take them hostage, and I will go from there. I have a PowerPoint. It's not necessarily an intimate group, but I look forward to answering some questions if we don't go over them sometime in this. Um, and you know, let's uh, make this as informal as possible because I really regret I have to talk to them to sit here and try to lecture to you. Um, that's me. I'll never look this good again. Uh, when I took office, when I was blessed enough that you guys could have trusted me with this office uh, 10 years ago, uh, uh, God bless him, Doug, Doug Melvin was a tax collector then. And I, used to, I remember seeing him in this picture, and it looked like it was from 16 years ago when he first took office. And I said, no, I'll never do that. No, I'm not doing it. So, <laughs> <laughs> all the lot of us are frosting our hair and losing it in this room, so we understand why you do that. So, well, what do we do? Uh, the pride, this, is, this is important, I think, to try to get some of the uh, information on exactly what the property appraiser does and what the property appraisers don't do. Um, but we, there are about 550,000 properties in Lewisburg County, fairly large jurisdiction, as you know. Um, and that includes all types, residential, commercial, industrial, uh, various types of property types, and also tangible personal property, which are the, the, the good the things that if you have a business that you use to utilize to utilize to your business computers, desks, tables, what have you, that, that uh, people, the business center returns. Oh, we will pass out later when I get, when I get to the value stuff. Um, this is very important. I put this, I had this put in very, this is to get me off the hook. We do not set tax rates, and we don't collect taxes. Just remember that the tax collector is the one they write badly about in the Bible. Property appraiser is not anywhere in there, okay? I'd like to be, but not in a bad light, okay? Nobody ever flipped the table because of me. Uh, but that's important to know. We're part of that process, and we'll go through exactly how, what ends up being your at lower tax at the end of the day. Uh, but it's important to kind of make that distinction. So how do we do it? Um, well, the presidential side, which is one of the things that you're probably most interested in here today, uh, we have to physically inspect actually over a five year period. Um, by, by law, we have to physically inspect every property in Hillsborough County. We do it over a four year period, we literally theft the county in quarters. Now, as you might suspect, with 550,000 properties, 300,000 residential properties, how would you physically inspect those? Well, the old fashioned way, um, was that we had, and we still do, we have our Priuses and some of the uh, hybrid grab fours. Uh, so we're very green. Uh, folks out, and they literally do a wind, look up a windshield assessment or, or a uh, uh, review of, of people's property, drive right, through the neighborhoods, kind of take a look at it. it. Looks like it did five years ago, four years ago, maybe. Um, we also use technology now uh, that we have. So the OB report allows us to create a windshield environment, a desktop with two large monitors, all the information having to do with the property, and allows our folks to literally kind of work their way down the street using street views and enhanced aerial photography to kind of review the properties. That's, that's basically how we do it over the course of time. Now, a lot of times we'll get a question asked, um, well, how does, how does what you do uh, differ from Say if I hire a fee appraiser to kind of do a price for my house because I'm going to sell the house or I'm going to do a loan or whatever it may be. Uh, the approaches to value are the same. And yeah, there's really basically three approaches to value. The, the uh, sales comparison approach, which, is, as the name would note, uh, is that you, you take a, 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 a group of, of comparable properties and you compare them, their sale prices, uh, to the subject property. And that should give you an idea of how much the subject property should be worth in the arm's length transaction. The difference is we do it, we do what's called mass appraisal. Okay? Because again, we have hundreds of thousands of properties, much, much larger universe of uh, properties to look at. So if you're to hire someone at Maryland to hire somebody to come do a fee appraisal, then they pick out three comparables in the neighborhood. And it's a very kind of granular look at the property. They're going to go inside of it and they can really kind of get into the details. And you know, her house has granite countertops and gold fixtures and the one next door it doesn't is it should as much as I don't I don't care that uh, that was a setup by the way I should say that. Um, but it's three comparables, four comparables in the neighborhood. We're doing it largely based on on a computer uh, assisted mass appraisal system in which we put a lot of information into the computer based on our square footage. Um, it's the same approach but it comes out a little bit different because again um, we're using 
a much larger group of properties. The other, the other two approaches to value are the same um, in what we do and, and other creations may do. Commercial, um, largely use the income approach if it's an income producing property. Question. Um, what's that, Steve? Um, if not, it's no question. Um, you know, if it's commercial property that's income producing, we use the income approach. I mean, obviously, that if you have an income producing property and you own it, you have a certain uh, amount of income that you expect from your investment, and that gives you an idea of what something's worth to you. And the other is the cost approach, which um, would be the cost of replacement of a, of a property, replacement of a building or a structure or an improvement, uh, and then and minus depreciation, and then add land value to it. Um, as you might suspect, sometimes these are blended. I can't imagine what the folks down south, my my, my compadres uh, down south, will be doing. Um, where they have entire properties from white top and figure out like those things. But, so this is, and, and I'm old enough to remember they used to get a thing called Grandma Rock on, on Saturday morning. Some of you may remember that, right? Um, and, and I used to love that this, I'm just a bill. Remember the thing, I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill, two members, right? It was great. It kind of gave you this, this thumbnail of exactly how the process of building passed back when they used to pass bills uh, in Washington, where Tal passed. Um, that weren't for some of these sessions. And, uh, but this is basically how the, the, the process works. Okay, I'll take you through it. So again, we determine the property appraiser's office, uh, determines the value of all of the property in Hillsborough County. Okay? Um, all of that property, and then also any exemptions that people apply for that they may qualify for. That's what the Maryland's department does. Uh, and that's based on and support this day, January 1st. So, Many of you recently received a trim notice from me, right? Um, we'll go over what a trim notice is. Uh, or, or a notice of proposed taxes. Um, it's based on the value of your property on a given date. That date is January 1st of the year. So when you receive a trim notice next August from me, uh, it'll be based on January 1st, 2023. At top property status of 2023. Um, the trim notice you just recently received in August from, from us was based on January 1st, 2022. So in essence, we're kind of like historians, because it's eight months later when you receive it. But it's important so that we're, we're comparing apples to apples that everybody gets their, assess, their value assessed on the same day, okay? So that January 1st uh, date is very, very important to us. Now, as you might suspect, and one of the things that's gonna be going on, I was just on the phone with uh, the lobbyist, the attorney for the Property Appraisal Association, uh, it says the property status of January 1st, 2022. Well, obviously, a lot of folks down south, their property is very different than it was January of 2022. So they've already received their notice of proposed taxes, and their taxes are based on January 1st, but their property is not. Generally, in those cases, the legislature goes back and does an abatement of some type to address those issues for folks. Um, because if you had your house burned down on December, on December 28th, uh, uh, you know, and, and so January 1st, this property was uninhabitable, the property would largely go on as vacant property on January 1st of the given year. Well, if it goes away during the middle of the year, because of an act of God like this, technically you're on the hook for the tax this for the way it was January 1st. A lot of times the legislature will go in and do something to help those folks. Uh, they did it with, this, with when the condo collapsed. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, and they actually passed some of that legislation will apply to these types of disasters going forward, but it didn't include this this year. So I'm, I'm expecting the legislation when they go back to do some sort of debate for those folks. Um, so that kind of that January 1st uh, kind of came back and fight, fight those folks. So once we have all that information, we pass all that up, that, that, that value information on to the taxing authorities. Now, who are the taxing authorities? City of Tampa, Hillsborough County, school board, uh, various port authority, aviation authority, uh, small cities like Temple Terrace, they all are tax authorities. They have the ability to set tax rates or what we call millage um, based on the desired revenue that they would like to have to fulfill their budgets each year. They, they set those rates, okay? And they went through that process just recently before the notice went out um, and determined what they wanted to do with all the Potential uh, extra revenue to buy this year. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, once that happens in August, the notice of proposed taxes goes out. That's what's called a trim notice. 
Um, at that point, our, our phones light up, and, uh, uh, and we answer as many questions as we can. Now, the important thing to know, and I think we just now passed this deadline, um, is once once you receive your trim notice, you have a 25-day period, not just receive it, it's mail, 25-day period in which to file a, what's called a value adjustment for appeal. Okay? I don't know if any of you have ever done that in this room. Um, but it's the quasi-judicial process by which you can challenge your value or perhaps an exemption that we've denied uh, or, or revoked um, in a given year. So that, that day has just passed. In any given year, we may get anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 uh, on the high end of value adjustment board petitions out of 550,000 properties. So it's a small percentage of this time. We're, we're less than that way. Uh, place like 90 days, they get 50, 60,000 a year, more. It's, it's, a, it's a cottage industry company. Um, when that happens, we try to work with folks as best we can. I will tell you, our, we'll set up those up in our office, um, Ty goes to the taxpayer, the property owner. And we're going to try to do everything we can to keep people out of having to go through hearings and, and got the dead losses or anything like that. We try to work with folks. Sometimes people, you know, um, want to go through the whole process, but I, I can tell you that we, when you look at it as a percentage of the properties that we have and the amount of, of value just for things we have in any given year. For the most part, a large percentage of that over 85% are withdrawn, satisfied one way or the other because we work with folks. It's very important to do that. Once that happens, then the tax bills go out in November. You pay them early, you get a little, little, uh, little bit off, and then all the revenue comes in, and the tax authorities spend it the power they see fit. Um, well, probably not the way we'd like them to spend it. With us. <laughs> so just to give you some highlights, did you know the property values have gone up? <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that, this, that we can live in historic times in so many ways, but this is historic, trust me. In 2021, January 1st, 2021, we had about $184 billion in taxable value. That's overall just the market, not tax value. Just the market value in most of our time. Okay? $184 billion. And that was a healthy increase in 2020. In 2020, 20, January 1st, 2022, $234 billion worth of tax or adjusted market value. About a 21% increase in overall adjusted market value. And as we know, that's value. Sales prices in certain areas, certain markets, 30, 32%. You, you guys have read all the articles about it, um, of what people are paying crazy, uh, you know, what they've been paying for properties and that kind of thing. Now, the second, the second thing is taxable value. Now, the difference between your just market value and taxable value, okay, is that once you back out exemptions and exempted properties, save our homes cap, all that kind of good stuff that, that folks uh, have, then we have about $140 billion in taxable value out there. Again, up some 15, 16% from 2021, okay? Now, you may ask, well, gosh, that means there's a lot more money to go around for the tax authorities. Uh, that's invite them to come <laughs> and ask them why they didn't get your taxes this year. Okay, I didn't say that. So, just trying to get myself off the hook. All right. Some ideas. Uh, now, this doesn't show up as well. It looks a little bit lighter green. It's actually darker green. We wondered, and, and so we put these slides in there, and many people wondered, well, what would happen if what happened there's the pandemic? And, and frankly, it was the great new world for us all, right? So we wondered how what the effects would be. In fact, I have a panel a group of experts to try to talk about what might happen, not knowing that Tom Brady would come here. Um, and then everything goes to the roof. So I'll take him away. Um, and so anything in green was rising property values. This is pre-pandemic. Right? And we've had rising property values really since 2013, as we came out of the Great Recession, property values have gone up six and a half to eight, nine percent each year, overall countywide. A modest amount each year, uh, not like the 21 percent we just saw. So in 2021, in the middle of the pandemic, you still saw rising property values. In fact, where some of the darker green, you can see some areas, including some of your own, um, the property values actually continue to go up, going up during the yeah, that, okay. And then in 2022, let's see what now I guess, you know, hopefully post pandemic, uh, we can see that it hasn't changed. And in fact, it's countywide. Um, 
It's really amazing. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Obviously, there's a lot of folks that have been, some, of, some in this room, I'm sure, that come here recently with uh, the skateboard they work. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, the values of properties have gone up because we've been giving away free money since 2008, one way or the other. So, insurance sure rates were low, another reason. So, we're starting to see a little bit of a chilling in terms of the fact because of interest rates going up and what have you. It'll balance itself out over time. But, so, I don't know if we'll have a 21% increase next year, but I'm sure we'll still see an increase, but maybe something a little bit more modest. Homestead home state exemption, how many folks have a home state exemption? By the way, I was going to ask, have you received the trip notice? Did you read it? You've been lying. My kids do it to me all the time. Okay. Why, why, if you didn't read it, why didn't you read it? It's easy. No, it says at the top, this is not a bill. I know. It's not a bill, I don't have to read it. I would say, when you do receive that, it's very important. It's got literally everything that's the, the paella that is in your taxes at the end of the day or on that, on that piece of property. All right, most of the exemption is the, the queen or king of all of, the, of all of our exemptions, okay? Started out many, many moons ago as a $5,000 exemption to your, uh, to your property. If you qualify to try to attract people here, you know, and everything with pumps and alligators and snakes and all kinds of, we even had oranges back then. Um, and, and now it's up to $50,000 when your primary residence. Who wants to tell me what, their primary, what a primary residence means? Where do you live? That's a good one. Anybody else? Permanent. Permanent. Okay. Yeah. Fifty percent. Six months in one day. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Actually, the closest was the first one. Your primary residence is, the, is where you live. That's where you claim to be. Where you live. So many of you, anybody have a have a residence elsewhere or where you came from still? Okay. You got that back out of dodge. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I mean, you can have a piece, uh, in fact, I was, uh, piece, I know somebody has, unfortunately, they may not be there anymore, but down south has had a vacation home and had one here. It's the one that you, that you deem to be your primary residence. So we're not out there. Now, we do, and Maryland's folks do, make sure that somebody's not claiming one that they're not, not actually their primary residence. If they're claiming a, their primary residence in Hillsborough County, but they have their voter registration and their, you know, and their driver's license and all this kind of stuff at another address, it's pretty, pretty good chance they're not actually living in Hillsborough County. But if they claim this there, yes, sir? Who sets the homestead value? The homestead value? Okay. Yeah, it's set, it's set in statute and in legislation. And it, so it, it's up to $50,000. So the way the law says the first $25,000 of your property value is exempt, regardless. The next twenty-five thousand is taxable, regardless. So, if your home was worth twenty-five thousand dollars or less, um, you're going to pay. A, you're, I'm saying this right. right. Good. I've got to my, my conscience here. Okay. I'm going to see your money. Uh, so, the, the idea is that everybody will pay something, okay, after the, after the first twenty-five thousand. The third twenty-five thousand dollars. So, if your home was worth more than fifty thousand, that if you apply for homestead. You're exempt up to fifty thousand dollars on the first twenty-five thousand and the third twenty-five thousand of value. Um, but that's all set in statute. Based on that. I mean, there are very few residential properties worth less than seventy-five thousand dollars. Yes, sir. As you said earlier, the home values have been going up year by year by year, but the homestead exemption does not. That's a, a bill that Senator Brandis had last year. There have been a couple of efforts to kind of look at that issue of doing a constitutional amendment to change how Homestead is about the value of Homestead and maybe making it and indexing it to inflation or doing something so that it, it would grow or contract, it wouldn't contract, but it would grow based on values. Uh, that has not happened yet. But it is, no, it is. It is Regressive in this, in this, to, from the standpoint that it's a set amount, regardless. I will tell you there is a constitutional amendment on ballot this year to uh, for what, what's being termed hometown heroes, which would add an additional twenty-five thousand uh, dollar exemption for a select group, a wide group of folks that are like first responders, teachers, and other folks as well. Um, so that every year they kind of look at this thing and they look to add to it or whatever and add different different exemptions. But as far as the actual homestead exemption, 
they haven't come to an idea of exactly how housing indexes sort of would grow commensurate with values. Good question. Yes. Yes. We the elephant in the room. Yes. Excuse me, Coach. Yes. Could we just hold our questions until the end, because otherwise it gets disruptive, and some of the questions may be he may be addressing in the presentation. Okay. Thank but you very much. Those are great questions. <laughs> okay. Now, what does the homestead exemption mean? Okay. Well, there's two things. It gives you that, that up to $50,000 off your, off your um, the, the assessed value of your primary residence, your talked about your primary residences. It also, at that point, then sets your cap for the Save Our Homes cap. Save Our Homes cap was created a number of years ago when, remember, at one point, your just for market value, which we talked about that first $184 billion, or whatever it was last, and then going up to 200 your adjusted market value and your taxable value are the same amount, minus your exemptions. So in any given year, this is prior to Save Our Homes, uh, a property can go up, if a property like this year, the property values went up 21%, your taxes can go up 21%. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, Save Our Homes cap was an effort to, because back then, the seniors and savers, um, like yourselves, uh, were folks who were being taxed out of their homes, okay? And they couldn't keep pace. So Save Our Homes was an effort to then create a cap so that you're, so that you're, um, and I don't mean that that way because I'm supposed to be in some years. <laughs> and I'll say it in our case. So, um, so we, <laughs> I have to make sure I don't that in this world. Um, so the, what they did is now with the Save Our Homes cap, your taxable value in any given year can't go up more than 3% or inflation, whichever is less. Now, going back to, 2008 inflation has been less than 3% each year. As you know, this year it's it's higher um, than that. So that, so this year taxable values for the you know, homestead properties are for the most part you can see a 3% increase. But still, 3% increase versus 15% increase, a 21% increase uh, is significant for folks that have, that have the Saver Homes cap. Okay, um, that's important. Each year that's that's pegged based on the CPI or the or the price of X, uh, inflation, okay? Requirements, again, legal title as of January 1st. That date again. As your primary residence, and you have to apply before March 1st. Now, I have a eight-year-old, a 12-year-old, believe it or not, I've been a late bloomer, uh, and a 15-year-old. And that March 1st deadline is like when you say to your kids, uh, if you're not ready in five minutes, we're leaving without you, okay? <laughs> did you ever leave your kids? Because I thought I was a BCF, don't tell me you ever did, okay? All right. No, it's not. So we can do uh, uh, considerably file uh, applications. That would be this terrible hard uh, after March 1st. But you have to have a deadline that's in the statute. But they do have a wiggle room. And really, all the way up until September, after the notice is filed, uh, we're still we're still considering uh, late file applications. That's just for a few guys in here in the room to know. Uh, now that's important. If we want to make sure that folks get the, get the, their exemptions as timely as possible, particularly with values going up the way they are. I'm not going to go through a lot of this, but, but again, because I kind of talked about it, as the adjusted market value goes up, okay, the, your tax rate value can't go up one three percent, so that creates this differential between uh, your your taxable value and your adjusted market value. Now, here's what happened, and it's the law of unintended consequences. Uh, once we pass that, great constitutional amendment, folks had this, this great tax benefit. Well, guess what? We didn't want to give it up, so I'm not selling my home, I can't sell my home because I'd lose it. Portability came about. There was a, back in 2008, there was a constitutional amendment that took effect in 2009 that said for folks that uh, would call abandoned the homestead, they sell their, their homestead property, that they can then take the differential, the difference between up to a half million dollars of their upsizing or percentage of their downsizing between their adjusted market value and their uh, and their taxable value with them to their next one instead of property to lower the initial taxable value of the new property. Okay? That's what's called portability. Okay? Um, similar to the homestead, and a lot of times we do we take these applications at the same time. You have to apply um, 
by January 1st, or you have to be there until January 1st, as you know, you apply the same way March 1st, you make a week. Um, and you have, you have three years to establish a new homestead. You have the remainder of the year that you're in, and then two more years, so three tax years. Uh, there's that March 1st deadline. And again, it depends on whether you're upsizing or downsizing as to whether or not you take the full dollar for dollar up to half a million dollars for your percentage um, based on that. And many of you may have taken advantage of that when you guys moved down to in some other part of Florida or moved uh, from someplace in Ellsworth County uh, to use the court. Now, I, I, I want to make sure I touch on the only questions that we had. There was, we had that question, there was the other one about moving. Okay. I don't know if we touched on that exactly in the PowerPoint. Did we? Did we? Did we? Did we? Tax estimator, um, if you've ever been on our website, it's a great place to find information about anything that I'm talking about today and probably a lot more uh, understandably, or if you just want to stalk somebody, a great place to go. Um, tax estimator, you can put in here, if you have a sale price, you can go in here, put it in, estimate the, 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 your, uh, the amount that the taxes may be for the property. It'll give you a number between 85 and 100 percent of uh, your sale price, which you give you the benchmark kind of to go on, I would say here on the, on the 100%. It may have been, frankly, would probably be less. Just for kicks and giggles, this sale is the sale of the old Jerry, Jerry Jeter house. Um, it's a little bit out of my price range, $20,532,795. I could have done a 795 um, So just to give you an idea of the people that purchased that home, with all that Tom Brady home all over it, um, their their estimated taxes are somewhere between three hundred forty-three thousand four hundred three thousand dollars a year, and they're going to tear it down and build three houses there. Yeah, It'd be crazy. Because the gentleman that bought it realized, first they didn't like the way the house was, you know, laid out and what you know. So, and uh, and they realized why well, why I got one house worth twenty million dollars when I can build three there that are worth. 18 million and the numbers work, so just crazy. So, I think Brady's going to retire and move into one of them. Always want to live on the water. It also allows you to put in portability to figure out what the, what the uh, initial taxable value will be once you uh, once you put uh, your portability in there as well. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this if, if you'd like me to, I can. But I want to get to the exemptions. And there's lots of exemptions out there. Um, I will point out, first of all, widow and widower exemption. Oh, we got that in here. Yes, okay. This exemption for years was a $500 deduction off of your taxes, literally going back to the early 1900s. And for years, the Property Trade Association, we would go to the legislature and say, this doesn't make sense. As you said, property values are going up, and all these other exemptions are worth more. And this one really ends up being, I don't know, $10, $18, off your, off your taxes at that. Uh, and finally, this past year, and it's crazy what they'll spend money on, but for every, every year they would run the fiscal on it and say, oh, we can't afford it. Um, and finally this year, in the tax package, they raised that deduction up to $5,000 for for uh, whatever exemption. Um, if it's something that you already have, you should, that should start to reflect it if you, if you think that you might qualify for it. Um, here I'm supposed to help you. Uh, you can do it online or come to come our office right here uh, in the, uh, the county building right on the other side of the interstate, and we'll, we'll take care of you. Okay. The personal disability exemption, someone was $500 deducted off their assessed value, um, but it's just your credit rates too. Um, if you have a particular uh, disability, I don't know if you want to add anything what that disability means. The 100% disabled? Yes. Get a doctor, right. No, but I We are hiring. Here's the thing with the, this is the limited income seniors, okay? And I always love to do this, um, although I know the amount now. This is based on the, um, what's the, the federal, uh, what we call the federal poverty line, and this year is $32,560, $32,560. So your income is below that, then you can qualify for the senior citizen uh, 
an exemption. Up to fifty thousand dollars. Thirty-two thousand five hundred and sixty. And that's household. That's household income. And that every year changes slightly, but it always seems to go up a little bit each year. Right. It'll probably go up a little bit again next year. That's a, that's a big, and again, you apply for it. You have to be, it has to be, you have to be the owner, uh, at least one of the owners, 65, so at least one of the owners. So if you live with, with a spouse that's less than 65, or you have family living there and they were on the deed as well, but one of the owners is 65, they can apply for it by January 1st, that magic date. You also have to have your homestead exemption um, as well. It's based on your income in the prior year based on your adjusted gross income. That's, that's a big. Does anybody have that one here? Maybe. That's the same one. Okay. Oh, this is not, this is a sorry, different one. Similar, but you have to meet the homestead requirements and the income requirements. Okay? Uh, the property must be less than $250,000. Now, this is an interesting one because there's not necessarily a lot of those properties out there anymore. And also gets into a problem where the property value goes up over $250,000, right? I think the legislation did something on that. Hey, grandfather, yes. So if you, if you qualify before, you can keep it. If you value it now, it goes up over $25,000. At one point, you would lose it if you went over $250,000. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You would have to apply for next year, right now. Or, yeah, if, at the end, come and see Maryland, and you can take, see what, what you do to take the applications now. Yeah. Okay. And frankly, I wish we could come and set up the laptop because that's just taking applications right here, but we'll chat about it. Okay. There's a bunch of folks for folks that have intellectual disabilities in blind. Um, this is, you know, an exemption for folks, people that are blind. Um, Veteran disability, there's a bunch of them for first responders, veterans, folks that have um, survived the spouses, the folks that have lost uh, their spouse um, serving the country. Um, I won't go into all of the details here again. Marilyn's here to answer those questions afterwards if you think that one of these you might qualify for. There's a surviving spouse, um, this is called a Fallen Heroes Act, and that's it. Now, the question that then, I'll answer your question just a second. Um, we're just going to touch on the problem on the, on the, uh, sorry. Oh, um, on, on your ballot this year, you'll have that additional homestead exemption. Uh, I'm not going to take a position on it, but just so you know what it is. Uh, for some hometown heroes, that'll be an additional $25,000 exemption for a group of teachers, child welfare workers, uh, military folks, and what have you. Um, the idea is to allow, is to, Encourage uh, home ownership. The reality of it is, it's not something that makes it that much <laughs> more apt to buy at home, but for folks that have them in a certain area are would be recognizing their service. So uh, that's another exemption we'll be coming forward this year. A uh, question that you had, <coughs> had is related to related to folks that sold their property or bought property in 2021, right? Um, Here's, here's the issue. Once you, you're under the same or home staff or your homestead, um, within the year that you purchased the property, so if I'm a buyer, I come buy Marilyn's home, and she's been capped for how long you've been your home? 15 years, okay? So over the course of 15 years, her property value has probably gone up. Even if it was 5% a year, let's say it's gone up 45% in value, okay? And that's actually low. Um, she's actually paying on the time when, when the property is at set January 1st, okay, of the year that she purchased it, not the year she purchased it, but the following January 1st after she purchased it. Her cap set when she set her homestead exemption. So if the property is worth $150,000 then and now it's worth $450,000, okay, she's still paying on that $150,000. You know, I'm being, you know, um, you know, this is basically. But it kind of works. Um, at the point that the new owner buys the property for the remainder of the year, so if I buy the property and I take ownership and I, you know, today, for the remainder of this year through December 31st, I'm paying for 2020 
to uh, 2021, sorry, 2020 taxes, right? Because that's January 1st of this year. So she's been paying going forward. And then I'll pay for the rest. So that's so it always catches people because then most people pay right for the mortgage and that's true, what have you. Okay. Um, so I'm paying what's left of her taxes, which are probably quite low because she's been homesteaded for 15 years and the cap no more than 3% increase in taxable value. <laughs> From January 1st, 2023, okay, all right, 2023, that cap is going to reset to the actual just the market value minus my whatever exemptions I qualify for, and then it'll reset and we'll start working from there covered by the sale of homes cap. So as a result of that, now I'm paying on the actual just the market value in that first year, and then going forward, I'm protected. What has happened to a lot of folks this year are the people who purchased the home in 2021. They don't want fine. They were really paying the taxes of the previous owner. Um, the remainder of 2021, and we send out that dreaded term notice that very few of you read. Um, and some of the ones that did call this, um, uh, based on the values of 2022, and all of a sudden, wait a minute, I was, the, the, it said the proposed taxes of what I paid last year was $1,800 in taxes, and this year it's $3,400, $5,000, someplace. How is that possible? Remember, you're now that your cap is reset. You were you were under that that period of time that you owned it in 21. You were still under the cap based on the previous owner. And now you're paying on the full value of it in that first year, minus your exemptions, and you'll be protected going forward. Doesn't help you a whole lot, but that's what's happening. That's what's happening to a lot of folks. So we had about 70,000 real estate transactions of all types in most of our country last year. So those are the folks that are really feeling the full brunt of the increase in property value this past year. So is that the question that you have? If you have, if you have a question, could you please raise your hand? I, I don't think you feel any better, but I'd have to explain it. Yeah.
if I'm looking at my, this is not a real, and it's <laughs> chosen amount for first homestead and additional homestead, what, what, is, what's the, what is that additional? So remember, that there's 25, the first 25,000 is guaranteed to everyone. That second is not guaranteed unless the value of your property is a certain amount. That's that second homestead. But again, very few people don't qualify for that full $25,000. And, and my senior exemption is not what you said it should be. And then I also have a miscellaneous exemption. Is that widow's exemption? It could be. It, it could be. be. It gets along together. Right, it gets along together. So I would give a fair one afterwards when I take a look at it, and we can make sure that, 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 that you have everything that you're supposed to have. Now, I will tell you one thing I didn't mention. A lot of people then get the tax bill and say, wait a minute, the notice of proposed taxes says my taxes should be $3,800. And I get my tax bill that's $4,500. Remember, there's not ad valorem uh, of taxes. You know, if, if, you're, if, you're, you know, if you're a county commissioner or something, or a politician, but I guess, I can sort of, um, you might call them fees or something on my but they're taxes. Um, you know, for other things, not ad valorem things, garbage, maybe you're in a special taxing district, those kinds of things. Those things are probably lumped on top of your ad valorem taxes. So we'll get calls and say, wait a minute, you misled us now. We can remember this. These are not ad valorem or not on the turn notice. Okay? Other questions? Why did the bus keep us special debt? Okay. I can answer that one better than you. That's probably good. When real estate bodies decline drastically, how will that affect your tax structure? That's another great question. No, his question was when real estate values fall drastically. So let's say 2007. It's interesting because when I took office in 2013, January 1st, January of 2013, the, we were coming out of the Great Recession, um, as you know. And, and uh, I always, I always thought, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky not to have been part of that. I can't imagine what it was like for my predecessor and some of these folks who were in the office. Um, having to deal with that when property values tanked, uh, you know, similar amounts to what they've gone up in a year. Um, and then now we're, we've got sort of the opposite effect this year. The reality of it is we can never really, because we think, again, think of us as historians. It's based on January 1st of a given year, the value of a property. Well, the, the, the property doesn't tank in value on one day, January 1st. It does it over the course of time in a year. So January 1st, your properties may be worth whatever they're worth today, and God forbid, you know, Putin drops the bomb, um, and all of a sudden, you know, we go into a nosedive. Well, about your tax bill next year is still going to be based on January 1st, 2020, or what I'm saying, let's say it happens after January 1st, 2023. We can Christmas, and then the bomb. Um, so, I shouldn't think about that, but, um, so, it, let's say that happens, but it's after the fact. Well, then you're going to get a tax bill or next year or notice of proposed taxes in August based on the value as of January 1st. But because we're historians, it doesn't take into account that, that downturn in that first year. So we never quite catch up. You know, you pay, So if you purchased in 21, you paid more pain than you probably expected to pay. If, if the world were to tank sometime in 23, you're not going to feel the relief quick enough you know, it's just the way that that process works um, as a result of that. Uh, that, unless the legislature goes in and gives some kind of a, 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 a allowability for us to do but A lot of this stuff is set by the Constitution. They can't really even move stuff around that much. So that would have applied to 2008? Yeah, so, if, well, say in 2008, it really tanks. Well, if you got, things were pretty good up until 2007, right up to January 1st, 2008. I think maybe we were... There are a lot of predictions, but it hadn't all happened at that point. But you may, let's say after 2000, January 1st, 2008, your property value was X, and the, the county goes in the dumper in, two, in February, whatever, May of 2008, well, your, your taxes are still going to be based on the value as it was when things were still pretty good for that first year. Um, and, 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 you know, so it never really, we never, it never really reflects quick enough or helps you fast enough when things go up really like they are. She knows a lot, so we're going to stand up. Time for you. Um, okay, so on our trim notice, we have this is your likely tax, but this is what it actually could be. Right. When does that get decided? When, when, when the county commission or the tax authorities, all the tax authorities get together and finally set their tax rates. You're going to have a thing in there called the rollback rate, which 
but there's one of them that says if they to uh, to accrue the same amount of revenue as they did last year, this is what the tax rate would be. Okay, they'd never do that. <laughs> in fact, I presented the I'll say this in this room. You know, what the heck? <laughs> When I presented this year to the county commission and city council, um, the mayor and the uh, and uh, the, the, uh, it wasn't the, it wasn't the, it wasn't the commission, but um, somebody very high up in the head of the county <laughs> called me and said, "Make sure you don't mention the rollback rate." Um, I did. The slide was in there, but I didn't mention it. Um, so, so, so it says. So, so there is something in there. So let's say if we made, if we had 184 billion dollars in taxable value last year, and that, that, that as a result of that, after we applied it, we had X, you know million dollars to spend. So one of those is what would they? What would the tax rate be to have that same amount as last year? Okay, um, that's called the rollback rate, and they have to put it out there. Um, but you know, frankly. Value, you know, the, the amount of doing business for everybody, including the government, goes on. Um, some, some of the taxing authorities elsewhere, say Pete, uh, I think the Port Authority of Hillsborough cut their tax rates slightly from last year's, reflective of the fact that they expected more revenue. Um, the County Commission, City Council, School Board, some of those other folks um, did not. Now, they didn't raise the millage this year. Um, now they did ask for it, obviously the school board asked for a millage increase and that, that uh, failed um, uh, fairly. And now there is another millage increase on the ballot now, but there will be the, the transportation one as well. So interesting year to ask for additional taxes, but again, that's just me. Yes? You draw a very nice crowd. Well, I'm, 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 blessed, Thank you. I'm blessed and honored. Thank you very much. Now, and, and Marilyn will be here. After we finish our business meeting, to which will be short, to go over anything that you might have. This is a perfect time to talk to her about the issues that she can handle. In addition, uh, and I do want to tell you that I have I have a wife, a mother-in-law, three kids, and two dogs who don't want to spend more than five minutes in the same room with me anymore. <laughs> this is incredible. So thank you so much. Thank you. Sir. Spent 
we had a total of income of 1772 Our expenses over that period of time was $24,238.93. Now, might want to know why we spent so much money uh, in expenses over the summer. And uh, as you know, recently you received your, uh, our, our directory, uh, our membership directory, where before we had uh, the company used to pay us uh, to give a, uh, to put our name in the book. And this year uh, we had to pay them to put our name in the book, and that, that amount of money came out to was $13,513, uh, $12,250 were for the directory, and then we had additional expenses, $1,263.71. That included, you know, we had a rent pot, uh, you know, put the directories in, uh, we had pot expenses, uh, $442. Uh, we had to build a ramp in order to get up into the pot uh, that we didn't know in the which I took care of that, uh, plus the uh, materials. That was a couple of hundred dollars there. So, um, and then we, as you know, uh, we had the poly bags uh, that we put the directories in, and those are gonna last us for years. Uh, you know, we got a whole bunch of those. Uh, we paid uh, $600, $600 for that. And so, that basically is a recap of summer uh, where total bank accounts are as of now. Are there any questions? If not, uh, somebody wants a report on it, they can stop by the office and get a report. We've been kind of How often are the directories renewed? Uh, right now, uh, well, the last time we had it was 2019. And now we just had it done in 2022 because of the pandemic and everything else that, that took place. So. Normally we would try it maybe once a year, but uh, it may not be possible uh, unless we raise our fees a tremendous a lot more. And then we had the problem of trying to find a printer uh, to print them. So uh, that put us behind uh, almost a whole year uh, to find somebody that was still in business that wanted to do the printer. So that's where we stand with the uh, director. So save your old directories. Uh, they're, they're good for a long while. You didn't get one? Uh, are you brand new into the community? April 1st. Uh, you're, you should have gotten one through the, uh, the president uh, or whoever your association would have. Uh, if your phone number or anything is wrong with your uh, uh, line, uh, please stop by the office. Fill out a uh, slip. Uh, we don't. Uh, COA office. Yes, I'm sorry. The COA office. We have a form you can fill out and correct, make any corrections. We don't like to take it over the phone because somebody may make a mistake in hearing, and you uh, know we're not. We're all not. We're all seniors, so we know we have our problems. So. We ask you to come into the office, fill out the form. That's right. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a few remarks here, and uh, then we'll get on with the memorial and give some grants. Uh, we're so glad to see all of, all of our friends and neighbors once again, and we're so fortunate to have survived Hurricane Ian. And our thoughts go out to the communities throughout Florida that did not fare as well. We need to be very thankful. The COA opened for business as usual on September the 1st. We've been busy with members stopping in for COVID test kits, copies, notaries, and of course we closed during Hurricane Week, but we are now back open for business 9 to noon weekdays, so stop on in. Uh, we want to thank all of our dedicated volunteers who have stuck with us and we've received some applications 
for Crow members to join as volunteers. Now that we're past the hurricane, we are going to be scheduling meetings to share information with those applicants, and so you may see some new faces at the COA as we discuss their interests. Uh, the COA is returning to our regular monthly meetings. This is the first one for the year. Our next meeting is scheduled for November 11th at 2 p.m. in this banquet room. Depending on who our speaker is, we may be the veterans theater. <laughs> uh, we look forward to seeing you as we kick off the year-end Thanksgiving and holiday season starting in November. We are working with the Master and Federation on upcoming holiday events. We are planning to have our holiday lighting contest as we did last year. This year we're also planning to have a golf cart parade through the Kings Point community. And we have, uh, we have enlisted Les Raba, who constantly got awards for the nicest decoration for years, and Chris Robinson, who worked with the um, Sun City Center on their parade. So they're agreed to assist us with planning these holiday events. So watch for more information about that. It's time for us to lighten up a little bit and enjoy the holidays. It has been a summer of change for the COA. Our long-standing COA secretary and office manager, Lucy Polson, decided to retire from her duties at the COA. We're very sorry to see Lucy leave, and we wish her the best. Our Vice President, Marianne Meeker, here has agreed to take on the duties of office manager on a temporary basis. <laughs> so we got to keep thanking her and telling her she's doing a great job. So, but thank you, Marianne, for sharing your talents and keeping the office running while we reorganize our office operation. The pay is fantastic. <laughs> as, as Forrest said, the COA membership directory were published and distributed. We thank Marsha Boyle for her work on the member listings, and we thank the association presidents for coming and getting them and helping to distribute the books to their residents. Again, if you find an error or need to change your listing, stop by the COA office. We are talking about maybe putting cookies out again. We stopped doing that during COVID, but you know, so but we can make changes for the next uh, edition. We do have a shredding day scheduled, and I'll ask Mary Ann to organize the upcoming shredding day to tell us about the plan. It's going to be November 1st, between 1 and 4. We're going to, like we did in the past, we're going to use the sign-up genie. And that starts, I believe, the start date start being shown uh, as in e-glass as October 17th. 